watercolour do's and don'ts. That's what we're going to be talking about in this video. Welcome back to my channel. If we haven't met before, my name is Michelle and on this channel you'll find all things watercolour, including lots of colour mixing and a little bit of mixed media too. Please do consider subscribing. If you click the little bell icon, you can get notified every time I have a new video for you. I make one free video a week here on YouTube on a Thursday with extra content on Saturdays for my Patreon subscribers. So today I've got 10 things for you that you should and should not be doing for your watercolour painting. So in other words, rather than just tell you things that you should be doing and things that you shouldn't be doing, sort of um, independent of each other, I'm going to go through 10 subjects when it comes to watercolour painting and I'm going to go through the do's and don'ts for each one of these. In other words, if I tell you not to do something, I'm going to give you the polar opposite and tell you what you should be doing instead. And whilst there are no absolutes for art, these are all based on things that I have seen my students get wrong time and time again over the years. Not just beginners, but also more experienced students. So I think there's going to be something for everyone in this video. So let's get started. And if you watch till the end, you're going to get a bonus tip too. So the first tip I have for you is don't work on loose paper and do pin your paper down in some way. So there are lots of ways that you can pin your paper down and the reason that you should do this is because if you work on a loose sheet of paper it will start to put up a great big fight. As soon as you get paper wet it starts to expand and because you won't be wetting the whole of the surface in one go or probably not then it's going to expand and contract unevenly. It's going to dry looking horrible and bumpy but not only that it's going to cause you problems while you're actually working on it. So if you have a bump in the paper then your paint will sit in puddles and puddles are you know very annoying for artists. They can cause a lot of uneven drying, they can cause you problems, they can cause you back runs and drying lines and just trouble all around. Um, the other thing that happens of course is the corners of your paper will just want to curl up and it will make it very difficult if you've got wet paint there it'll tip it back to the middle of the paper. Well you can see where I'm going with this, it's just not a good idea. So there are several ways and the three main ones I'm going to go through with you today will keep your paper a little bit flatter. Now the first and in my um, opinion the most effective one is to stretch your paper. It's also the one that will save you money because you can use relatively thin paper. I mean um, all watercolour paper is thick so we're not talking about thin paper as such but we're talking about being able to buy the watercolour paper that's not the huge huge heavy weight because that paper will still go bumpy if you put enough water on it. So stretched paper onto board looks like this. Basically it's been wet and then it's been stuck down with a certain type of um, tape. I'm not going to go through how to do it now but I do have another video all about that subject if you would like to watch it. I'll put it in the information cards above. If you don't see it there have a look in the video description and the link will be down there because it doesn't show on all devices. So I've got a painting here. This is just a um, just a YouTube demo piece but um, I started painting on it. It's not finished and you can see that it's not the right way up either is it? You can see that it's dried completely flat. Now it was very bumpy when I worked on it now it's completely flat and this is what stretching watercolour paper will do for you. It won't negate, nothing will negate any bumping whilst you're working on it but it will make it less and it will dry flat every time it dries. Even if I go back in and chuck a load of water on that picture again it'll go bumpy again slightly and then it'll dry it flat when I leave it to dry. So stretching your paper is the best surface that you can work on. Now if you don't want to stretch your paper what's the next best alternative? The next best thing is to use a watercolour block. So these are pads of paper that have been gummed all around the edges. So rather than a pad which might have been gummed along the top edge, these have been gummed all the way around. And then there's like a little gap. So after you finish your painting, you can sort of slide a knife around and lift off the uh, off the top sheet. So though uh, this paper isn't generally stretched, some, I think, Arches manufacturer, I think they do stick theirs down when the paper is wet. So there may be some slight stretching effect to the paper. Um, generally speaking it's not stretched or it's not as stretched as stretching paper yourself but it is gummed all the way around the edges and that can make a significant difference and if you're not using too much water in your picture if you're perhaps painting something botanical um, it'll be enough to keep your paper completely flat and if you are painting with something with a bit more water on it it should still dry pretty much completely flat at the end of the painting process. So that's the next one. The downside to blocks is of course that um, they only come in certain sizes so you won't be able to paint perhaps as large as you might be able to paint if you bought a, uh, a loose sheet of paper and stretched your paper. 
the uh, the final one and this is nowhere near as good but if you do nothing else at least tape your paper to the board all the way around and use tape that's a fairly um, a fairly uh, good width because you don't want just like a you know quarter of an inch or a couple of millimeters hanging onto the edge of your paper because as soon as it starts to get wet and particularly if you're using masking tape it's all going to lift so if you do nothing else at least tape your paper to the board before you start painting that alone is going to make a huge difference to your work so my next tip for you is do keep your paper clean and keep your hands off it and don't work on paper that is soiled and smudged and dirty and this is easy to do now sometimes i walk around my art classes i'm just going to grab something here and um, i hear this noise and what people are doing is they've got you know um, they've been rubbing out their their work with an eraser and they're doing this I'm only doing that to that painting because it's just a YouTube demo piece it's not a proper painting otherwise I wouldn't have my hands anywhere near it now your skin has oil in it doesn't matter how clean you are if you've just washed your hands it has oil in and if you've added something like hand cream even worse you will transfer that oil onto the surface of your paper so there are lots of things that you can do to keep your paper clean one of the things that you can do is to draw quite lightly and to rub out very minimally. And for goodness sake, when you are um, getting rid of those little rubber droppings, then use a dry brush. Don't brush them away with your hands. The other thing you can do is as you are drawing or even as you are painting, lean on a piece of um, kitchen paper on paper towel so that you're not getting um, both your oil from your skin on the paper and also so that you're not leaning in your work, especially pencil. It gets get very, very smudgy and it can get everywhere. You also want to clean up any pencil smudges with an eraser before you start working. So it's just a really good habit to get in because watercolour paint is just pigment and um, binders. And so it's very, very hugely affected. You know, acrylic oils will probably pretty much cover any muck you've got on your canvas. But when you're coming to uh, watercolour paper and watercolour paint, if you get any kind of oil or smudging or greasiness on your paper it's going to block the watercolor paint and it's going to cause you significant problems when you apply it and this goes as well to people that draw very heavily and just leave far too much pencil on the surface of the paper it blocks the paint so do keep your hands off your paper and keep your paper as clean as possible get used to as well when you're looking at artwork just hold your art always by the edges you never want to get the oil from your skin or anything else including hairspray sun cream anything no sprays no hand creams nothing don't get anything on your paper keep it very very clean and in that way it will take the paint and absorb the paint into the surface in a much much cleaner and um, more beautiful way so the next tip i have for you is do use two jars of water when you're painting and don't just have one jar of um, really mucky looking water that you don't change very often really important when painting to have clean water it's quite a simple one this i think um you know we got used to when we were at school didn't we just having our little jam jar next to us and you know it was just the one that we used but you know you're a grown-up now you can do what you want if you want to have six jars of water on your painting table knock yourself out you can do it now i realize it's not always possible to have more than one jar of water particularly if you're at an art class or if you're outdoors the best thing to do if you're outdoors actually and you perhaps have got a bottle of water and um, a little pot to put it in it's sort of minimal the best thing to do there is to have a very very small container for the water and to refill it and to chuck it often so that's something you can do to get around that problem but where it's possible do have two jars of water you can have quite large jars as well so what i do is i keep one jar for clean water and then the um, other jar for sort of um, the initial rinse um, eventually of course you know a little bit of paint will come out of that initial rinse and get into the next one so you still have to empty your water jars um, if you wanted to be really really extravagant you could have three so you could have one that you keep only for applying clean water to your paper where you need it and then you could have the two you could have one for the initial rinse and then one for the secondary rinse so you're still going to have to rinse and you're still going to have to change water but if you have two water jars on the go it just keeps the water a lot lot cleaner you're not polluting colors with opposite colors and muddying up your painting so my next tip is do use a brush that's large enough and don't try and paint everything with a very small brush. So this is something that I see beginners do time and again is they select a brush that's too small because they feel that they'll have more control with it. 
Now, although you may be able to manipulate a small brush more easily, it doesn't mean that a small brush will manipulate the paint more easily. In fact, the opposite is true. So the problem with a small brush is it doesn't hold much paint, which causes it to run out quickly. So this means a couple of things. One is that you don't get that lovely flow when you apply the watercolor. But the other one is that a small brush will take you longer to fill an area. So say for instance, you have a leaf and you want to fill that area with nice smooth paint. Now it's gonna take you ages if you use a tiny brush and what's gonna happen is bits of that leaf are going to dry. And this is when you end up with loads and loads of, uh, of brush marks everywhere. So if you find that things like skies, you're constantly getting lots and lots of brush marks. There are multiple reasons for that but one of them is definitely using a brush that's too small and therefore being forced to paint too slowly so that parts of your picture begin to dry. Now there's no exact rule with brushes and I only discovered recently that there's not even um, consistency across manufacturer sizes. In other words, size 10 from one manufacturer is not the same as size 10 from another manufacturer. However, the rule that I like to go by is just to use as big a brush as I can manage to wield in order to paint the thing. Now, with large watercolour brushes, the round type with the point, the one that you would use most often, these can do amazing amounts of detail. Have a go with your large brush and just have a play and see how much detail you can actually achieve with that large brush, especially if it's new and it's got a good point on I think you'll be astonished at how fine a line this big paintbrush will actually paint. So you only want to swap to a smaller paintbrush when you are forced to. And as for these really tiny paintbrushes, you know, size naught, size zero, size one, you pretty much, I mean, I never use them. I just never use them. The only time you would need a brush like that would be for, um, you know, very fine botanical work. Perhaps you were painting the little hairs on, uh, you know, gooseberry or something like that. Or maybe you were painting, um, you know, a squirrel and you were painting its whiskers or its eyelashes. That's the time you might use a tiny brush like that, but they're no good for general painting. And for watercolor, you know, taking too long over an area is your enemy. Speed is, um, is a great help to you and even application. And all of these things can be achieved by using the largest brush possible for that particular subject. At this point, if you're getting some value from this video, could I ask you for a favor? Could you please just click the like button? YouTube rewards channels with audience interaction. I'm so pleased that my channel is growing so fast and you can help me to do it as well by clicking the like button. If you like, share, subscribe, or even leave me a comment, YouTube will push this video out to more people and my channel will grow even faster, which means that I can teach more people how to paint. So the next one I have for you is do use enough water on your brush. Don't use a brush that's too dry and will cause the paint to run out quickly. Thereby you will end up getting a technique called dry brush. Now dry brush is a technique in its own right, but you don't want it all over every single painting. Now this is a particularly important thing to understand if you're coming from a background of acrylics. So sometimes people start painting with acrylics and then they move on to watercolors. I can always spot these people in my classes because they're painting with watercolors like they're painting with acrylics. Apart from anything else, it's gonna be extremely expensive for you if you keep layering the watercolor paint on with, to the same thickness as you layer on acrylics. So with watercolor, the paper should glow through the paint. Now this doesn't mean that your paint has to be wishy-washy or overly watered down or anything like that. It just means that when you mix your paint, the paint must flow onto the paper so that you get that lovely smoothness and um, you know those lovely wet into wet techniques and that lovely paper glow that everybody loves about watercolors. So really important that you put enough water in. And it's a common misconception with watercolors that sometimes if you go thicker and thicker and thicker with the paint, and I mean, I do use paint sometimes almost straight out of the tube, you know, straight onto a wet area, Nothing wrong with that, but there's a, um, a misunderstanding that to go thicker with the paint means that the color will necessarily be brighter. Now this is not the case. If you're painting flowers in a garden, for instance, and you have got some red lilies and you're painting the red and you're layering the paint really, really thickly, it won't look like a brighter red. It'll just look duller because you stop the paper from glowing through the paint. So although you want your colors to be strong and vibrant, and if you're using a good brand, they will be, you do want to uh, make sure that you're using enough water with the paint in order that it spreads cleanly and evenly and that it glows through the paper. Now the paint I'm using in this tutorial, when you're looking at bits where I'm painting, I'm using paints by Jackman's Art Materials. They're a British company that I have been working with. I've designed my own floral set and we also have a beginner's set coming out soon. If you like the look of the paints and you'd like a discount off of any of Jackman's art materials, you can find a 10% discount um, with my name. Just pop into the description of this video and you can grab your discount code and pop over to Jackman's and order some paints 
if you would like to. So the next tip I have for you is do work light to dark and don't be tempted to put bright, strong colours in first. Now, when you start to learn watercolour painting, um, you probably already know, and if you don't, I'm telling you now, you probably already know that you need to work from light to dark. And this is because it's a transparent medium. So what this means is that you cannot paint white on top of dark. Um, you cannot paint any light colours on top of dark because the dark will show through. So for instance, if you were painting a, an oil painting of a sky, what you could do there is you could paint a, uh, a blue sky and you could put white clouds on top of it. You can't do with that with watercolour. The, uh, the light colours have to be watered down and they have to be, sometimes if you're using white, it will generally be the white of the paper. So if you put dark colours in at the beginning, what you're doing is you're blocking those areas and meaning that you cannot put light colours on top. So you really, really have to work light to dark. And yes, it's tricky and yes, it's complicated, but it's quite a simple process to go through. Just look for the very lightest colour. Maybe it's white, you reserve that and then look for the next lightest colour and you put that in next. So in other words, if you have a bed of white daisies, you will need to reserve the white of the daisies and perhaps put any shadow colours in and then put the dark paint around the daisies. You cannot put the dark green on and then expect to put white daisies on top of it unless you go into opaque paint and then really you're going into mixed media. So just to get yourself out of trouble, make sure that you are quite religiously working from light to dark. The other problem with putting dark colours in first is they can bleed. So at some point you're going to have to point, paint up to the edge of that dark colour. Perhaps you put something like a strong purple in or maybe a strong purple flower. Then you want to put a light background behind it. Chances are as you paint up to that purple edge of the petal, some of that's going to bleed into the background because dark colours are more likely to bleed, particularly those that have any type of red or pink in. They seem to bleed worse than any other colours. So even though you know to work light to dark, don't be tempted to do it the other way around. And it is tempting because sometimes those dark colours, those really strong colours, well firstly they're, most, they're the most attractive colours, so we're attracted to those, we want to put those in because we think that's going to make our painting look fantastic and bright and vibrant. The other thing is they can often be um, colours that come straight from a tube. Very easy to mix then. We don't have to you know, worry about how on earth we're going to mix that weird sort of concrete path colour. We can just go straight in with those strong dark purple flowers. But if you do that, you're going to be getting into trouble later on and you're looking at having um, areas that you wanted to clean white and you've blocked them out by dark paint accidentally. And you're also le looking at areas of dark paint bleeding into light paint. So do make yourself work religiously from light to dark. So my next tip is a painting application tip. Do apply your paint evenly and spread it evenly and don't allow the paint to sit in puddles. Now, when your paint sits in puddles, it will dry unevenly and you will get back runs. So what happens is the paint around the puddle starts to dry and then the paint that's in the middle of the puddle that is wet is attracted to the damp area. It will spread outwards. It's basic physics. It wants to spread. It wants to even out the surface because water wants to seek a level. So that's what's happening there. And what it will do in terms of your painting is that you'll get a load of drying lines and strange marks appearing on your paper. So you almost always want to apply the paint evenly and spread it evenly. Have a look at it and make sure there are no puddles on it before you leave it to dry. Now there is a sort of a caveat to this and that is that on occasion you might create those back runs and those strange interesting shapes on purpose. There are some texture techniques that I teach and um, you know if you want to sort of make those cauliflowers on purpose for a specific type of, uh, of look that you're aiming for, this a specific technique, then yes, you might have uneven water levels. But generally speaking, for almost all of your painting, it's a really bad idea to have a puddle of paint sat on your paper. So very much related to my last tip, and that is do use your paintbrush to control the water levels on your board while you're painting, and don't be constantly hitting your board or dabbing at your board with paper towel or with rags. So um, this is just it's something that I see certain people getting into trouble with is, you know, it becomes a bad habit for some people. So if you've got into this habit of constantly blotting out your work with tissue, with rags, with whatever, try to get out of that habit and, um, and tell yourself never to do it. Basically, now there is a caveat to this. Just like the last technique I was talking about with puddles, there are occasions when you might use blotting as a specific texture technique. And that's something that I do teach as well. However, for the majority of times, you should not be constantly blotting at your work with a piece of paper towel. Now, what you should be doing is using your brush. 
Now um, your brush, once it's removed of water, will actually suck paint and water up off of the surface of the board. So I'm going to show you how it's done. The main thing to think of is that if you clean and dry your brush and then you place that brush tip into a puddle of paint, the paint will start to go up. It will be almost sort of sucked up. I want to use the term hoovering because um, in the UK, we, we don't talk about vacuuming, we talk about hoovering, which is kind of like, um, you know, it's every brand's, um, you know, it's every brand's dream, isn't it, to have their product associated completely with the action. So nobody vacuums in the UK, we all hoover. We might be using a Panasonic, but we're still hoovering. So I want to say hoovering, I don't know if that's a thing, I think that is a term that people use in other countries as well. But whatever it is, the water is going to be hoovered, it's going to be sucked up into the brush, and in this way, you can completely control the amount of water that's sitting on your paper. So as I said in the last tip, you don't want to be leaving puddles. So what you want to do is to sweep the, the, uh, the water up. Now, this can leave a mark in and of itself. So I'll show you that as well. It can be sort of um, it can be used as a technique actually to take a highlight out. But if you're just using it because you want to reduce the water levels, then you want to use small dabbing motions. And this will be much more effective at lifting the water without leaving a mark. Now when I get shown beginner's work and um, the beginner themselves thinks that the work is not very good, there's two things I usually see. One is a whole load of drying lines because they haven't learned yet to control the water levels and to control the paint. The other is that some areas have bled where it was obvious that they weren't meant to bleed. And this is usually because um, beginners try to work on the whole piece in one go. So if you find yourself just working on a painting, you know, working, 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 the whole thing's wet and then, you know, some of it's damp and you're trying to get dry bits, um, something that you probably don't realise is that when professional artists work on a painting, they frequently let the whole painting get completely dry before they either apply another layer of paint or work on a different area. Now this is something that you may not be aware of because you probably don't get to see it because nobody's going to make their YouTube video and include the 20 minutes where they wandered off and had a cup of tea and ate a banana and came back and continued with their painting. But it really is a very good idea for you to, from time to time, let your painting dry. Now if you are painting something like a botanical piece, perhaps a board that was full of flower petals, you're painting each petal individually, that might be okay because you know, whilst one's drying, you can be working on another one. There may be an area of your board where you can always work on a dry area, so that's fine. Or you may be doing something where everything needs to be wet, so that's fine too. But for the majority of cases, um, particularly where you've got um, things like flowers with a background, or particularly where you've got landscapes, you are at some point going to have to let the whole thing dry. I mean, you know, if I start a sunset painting and I put a load of colours in the sky, and on the lower part, you know, I've wet the whole board and I've dropped those colours in, I'm absolutely going to let that dry before I continue. Another reason to let your paint dry if you're working in layers is because it sets the paint into the paper more. So I was doing a tutorial for my Friday class last week and what we did was uh, we were doing seascape sunsets and so you know we wet the sky and we applied the yellow and then we let it dry and we wet the sky again and we applied the blue. Now you might be thinking to yourself well why go to the stage of you know letting it dry if you're just going to wet it again but it makes a big difference one of the things it does is it sets the paint into the paper now most paint is mixed with binders some of which will include gum arabic which is a natural glue now it's not a strong glue it's a water soluble glue but nevertheless it's going to fix the uh, the first layer to your paper a little bit so that when you apply that second layer of water it's not just going to bleed and run everywhere so really really important if you're going to be um, looking to do a high quality watercolour painting is that where you need to you allow your work to dry and I don't just mean sort of you know before you paint next to a, a damp area I don't just mean you know I, I get around my art class and people say well, I think it's dry and I thought it was dry maybe it's dry it is dry don't you don't you think it's dry Michelle isn't it dry and I'm saying it's not dry it's not dry and I know it's really frustrating and I don't, um, unless you have to, I don't really advise using artificial drying either because it can sort of dull the pigments, push them around a little bit. So we were doing this at my art class last week. We were all using the heaters to dry our work because obviously, you know, it's a two hour class and people want to get value from it. They don't want to sit for half an hour waiting for their work to dry. But if you're working at home and you're under no time pressure, then for goodness sake, put your work aside and just go away for half an hour. Just let it dry and you'll find that you have a lot more control over the painting process if you regularly allow areas of your work to get completely dry before continuing. 
So the next tip I have for you is do finish every painting and don't abandon your work halfway through. Now there's a couple of reasons for this and this is something that people often get into trouble with because it gets halfway through their painting. You know, we all have that optimism, don't we, when there's a lovely clean white sheet of paper and we start putting the paint on. This is going to be fantastic. This is going to be the best painting in the world. And then we get halfway through and disappointment has sunk in. You know, reality has hit, mistakes have happened and we just want to give up the whole thing and start again. So we get that sort of happy feeling of starting another painting. However, this is quite a dangerous thing to do because you're not actually getting the full extent of your learning if you do this. So there's a reason why your watercolour painting may not look very good halfway through. And that's because if you're working traditionally light to dark, you haven't got those strong contrasts in. So it is absolutely a stage that every watercolour goes through whereby it doesn't look very good halfway through. And this is the same for, you know, apart from perhaps botanical work where you may be, you know, painting a whole flower and then painting another whole flower, you might find it continues to look nice. But if you're doing landscapes or anything like that, certainly you get halfway through, your painting is going to look sort of drab and dreary and not very good at all. And this is really just because you haven't put those dark tones in at the end. Now, there's another reason to continue to the end even if you are convinced that the painting is not going to be, you know, it's not going to fly, it's not going to be any good, you still need to continue to the end. Because there are certain processes that you go through at the end of a painting, you know, tightening up the tonal contrast, getting those darks in. If you never get to that stage, you never learn anything. So allow yourself to go all the way through a painting, even if you think, and even if it is true that the painting is not going to be good at the end of it, because you miss an awful lot of your, um, your learning process if you don't continue the work and take it to its full extent. Sometimes it might be as well that you overwork things, but you almost have to overwork so that you learn how to not overwork. So don't stop your work halfway through. Do continue to the finished painting. So lastly, I've got a bonus tip for you, and this is more psychological than physical. And this is do allow yourself to make mistakes and don't have unrealistic expectations of your progress. Now, mistakes are absolutely necessary. They're a part of learning to paint. And there's a, there's a strange thing about art, isn't there? You know, you wouldn't turn up to a driving lesson and expect to be able to drive a car by the end of it if it was your first lesson. And yet people come into an art class, they have all this, you know, these high expectations of themselves and they expect to do, you know, to do very well right from the beginning. And it is not realistic. If you haven't painted for a lot of years or you've never painted, it is not realistic of you to expect of yourself that you will have this fabulous fast process and that everything will immediately start to go right for you, you can expect to make a lot of mistakes. You can expect to ruin a lot of pieces of paper. This is completely natural and it's the mistakes that teach us what not to do. Now, if you were, say, walking a small child to school and um, you, you took the journey and it was uneventful and somebody later on asked you what happened on that journey, you probably wouldn't remember a thing about it because nothing went wrong. If, however, as you went across the street, you slipped and you tripped up and you skinned your knee and all the passers-by were looking at you, you felt a complete idiot, you did that thing where you pretend it didn't hurt at all when actually it was agony, then goodness, you still remember that 10 years later. You'd be thinking to yourself, you know, every time you got to that same pavement with your grandchild or your child, you'd be thinking to yourself, I don't misstep because I did that thing. I did that thing. It was wrong. I, it was horrendous. I can't you know, imagine how awful that was. I don't want that to happen again. It's exactly the same with painting. It's the mistakes that will teach you, not the, uh, the things that go right. And it has to be the mistake that you make yourself. Now, I can tell you, you know, I, I, I go around my art classes and, the, you know, people say to me, oh, you've told me not to do this. I did it anyway. Because you're going to, you know, it's, it's like when you were a kid and, the, you know, your mother said to you, don't touch the oven door, dear. It's hot. And one day you just went, I'm just going to give that. Oh, and then you remembered. And then after that, you knew it was hot. So you have to make mistakes for yourself. And whilst you should obviously listen to the things that I tell you and that other art tutors tell you and that more experienced artists tell you, there's nothing like completely ruining yourself to fix it in your brain. So do allow yourself to make mistakes and understand that it doesn't take days or weeks to learn to paint. It takes years. Now, I had a lady come to one of my art classes once and um, she came to one class and um, she did OK and she seemed to enjoy the experience. And when she went, she was positive and happy. And she said she'd come back the following week, except that she emailed me on the Wednesday and said, oh, I, I can't come back. She said, um, I'm really disappointed myself. You know, I, I obviously have no talent in this area. And I was like, really, really? One lesson. You had one lesson. You know, if on your first watercolour painting, all you manage to do is transfer the paint from the, the, uh, from the paint pan or from the tube, 
via your brush onto the paper so some paint that was in a paint tube or a paint pan ends up on your watercolour paper. Success. That is success. It's really important that you allow yourself to make mistakes. Now that's not to say that you should just continue practicing and practicing and getting nowhere. You do need proper tuition and you do need to um, have what I would call deliberate practice. So deliberate practice is something that um, particularly sports people and business people have used for years and it's a way of learning that is really really focused and will give you um, a sort of a stepping stone to success. I made a whole video about using deliberate practice when being an artist and when learning to paint. You can watch that video right now.